Representative Stephen Sin is going to present House File 393. Hi. Hello, Madam Chair. I uh, would move that House File 393 uh, be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary Finance and Civil Law. Great. Um, Representative Stevenson, do you have an amendment? I do. I would move the A1 amendment, which is an author's amendment that gets the bill in the shape that I would like the committee to consider it in. Great. Any discussion on the A1? Do you want to tell us about it, or is it better to um, tell about it in context of the bill? In the context of the bill. Well, the amendment, uh, it's not a substantive amendment. It's a technical amendment that uh, results from some discussions between the PUC and stakeholders. Uh, and uh, uh, gets us in the in the place that is a, a more workable concept. Great. Why don't we go ahead then, and we'll um, do the amendment first. Any other? I think I asked discussion on the amendment at all. Seeing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. The motion prevails, and the amendment is adopted. Um, Representative Stevenson, do you want to tell us about your bill? Uh, yes, Madam Chair, members of the committee. Uh, this bill, House File 393, is a relatively straightforward bill that fills a gap in Minnesota law. Presently, if a consumer brings a consumer issue uh, to the, the PUC, um, there's not uh, an avenue for sort of a final decision that can be then uh, brought uh, uh, to a court in the event of a disagreement. Uh, we are the only state in the country that lacks that avenue to, uh, for consumers to avail themselves of their rights. Uh, um, and. Uh, would like to see that changed. Uh, for returning members, this bill will look familiar. We did uh, have this bill last year, and I, I recall it being a fairly uncontroversial bill. I hope it remains a fairly uncontroversial bill uh, this year. Uh, and to keep it a fairly uncontroversial bill, I'm going to keep my remarks brief so I don't get myself into trouble, and I'll turn it over to uh, a much more skilled um, testifier, Mr. Elwood. Good afternoon, Mr. Elwood. Would you um, introduce yourself for the record and proceed with your testimony? Uh, thank you, <clears throat> Madam Chair and members. Ron Elwood with Legal Aid. Really appreciate uh, Chair Stevenson bringing this bill bill forward. Um, Legal Aid uh, handles, among uh, many of its clients, uh, folks who are at risk of disconnection or denial of essential utility service. And um, not a lot, but sometimes we uh, identify uh, legal concerns that we believe uh, there's been some activity that uh, is, is um, raising a legal question, uh, challenging a tariff provision uh, or a rule. And we have um, found ourselves in the situation of not being able to raise these legal tariff and rule questions before the commission simply because of a strange confluence of current statute and rule, which essentially creates an impenetrable barrier. Once the consumer goes first to the utility, which this bill also uh, codifies and requires, second goes to the Consumer Affairs Office at the Utility Commission, and they do a very good job for the most part, but occasionally we have questions that we believe the commission ought to look at. The rules and law currently conspire against any consumer being able to bring that matter before the commission, and this bill simply corrects that. I would say a couple of things before um, uh, as stand for questions. First of all, um, this will not result in uh, floods of complaints coming to the commission. Forty-nine states have exactly the same statute. None of them have ever had any problems with an overwhelming, you know, group of people storming the gates. So this is this is sort of a routine thing that we're getting in line with the rest of the country. Second of all, the few complaints that we would bring forward um, would it's very important for the commission to entertain because it's invariably a it's a matter of retention uh, of utility service, which of course we need everybody needs. Second of all, it will raise questions that doesn't, do not only apply to that individual consumer, but they invariably are going to affect other consumers in that service territory, and in many cases, maybe every single utility consumer in the state. And those are issues that the Commission 
would want, I think, to, to be able to adjudicate. So finally, uh, before I close, I would really want to thank the Public Utilities Commission, the commissioners, Commissioner Sullivan is here, and I want to express my appreciation to him and uh, Executive Secretary uh, Seifert and the staff of the PUC who work with us to craft the language to make it fit in their, with their current procedures. I want to thank all of the gas and electric utilities, uh, Excel, Centerpoint, Minnesota Power, Otter Tail Power. We work with all of them. They are comfortable with this bill. And I would like to thank the Citizens Utility Board, the Minnesota Community Action Partnership, and the Attorney General. They have all expressed support. They have letters in your packets. And I thank you very much for the time. I'll stand for questions. Thank you for your comments, Mr. Elwood. And any questions? I see Rep Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, I'm just trying to quickly go through the fiscal note. And I do know, I, I know you said that the number of complaints would be uh, exceptionally low but the fiscal note does say that we need two new FTEs so two full-time people at the PUC to process this additional work which uh, if we're talking about five or six complaints a year that seems rather excessive so I'm just wondering if you can either the author or if Mr. Elwood would help me understand the difference between the fiscal note and the testimony oh well you know, representative I, Stevenson uh, madam chair uh, representative <coughs> O'Neill uh, I'll say just briefly that when, when I look at the fiscal note, what I see is uh, that uh, assumptions that there's a large number of complaints that they already, I mean, they're getting these complaints, they're based on, on prior years, and a certain number of those would be uh, appealed to the PUC through the process created by this bill. Um, they're, they're estimating 5 to 10 percent or 25 uh, to 50 uh, complaints, and that two-thirds of them will be dismissed and one-third will go through. Uh, the informal process and an average of one case would go to a con uh, contested case uh, later on. So I think that the numbers, as you kind of go further into the fiscal note, kind of line up with what Mr. Elwood was saying, but I, I would defer to Mr. Elwood to say further. Mr. Elwood, did you want to speak any further? Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Neal, I'm going to let the PUC talk about that. I can only talk from legal aid standpoint, and I can tell you in the last 10 years, maybe a half a dozen cases we would want to bring forward, if that. But there, the reason that it, this is here is because even though there are a few number of cases, and one could argue, well, if there's so few cases, why do you even need this? But the fact of the matter is though every one of those cases raise critical generic issues that are really important and affect a lot of people. And, and that's why we're here before you to bring us in line with all other 49 states that have this right for residential consumers. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. I'm wondering if the PUC could just help us understand why we would need two full-time people. Even if it was the 25 to 50 complaints, um, it just seems like a lot of staff time, but maybe you can help us understand. Sure, thanks. Um, Mr. Seifert, please state your name for the record. Madam Chair, committee members, uh, Will Seifert, Executive Secretary, Public Utilities Commission. I mean, we outlined our assumptions in the fiscal note. We, we thought we were being pretty conservative. We don't really have any idea how many will be appealed. Um, in terms of the numbers, you know, we, we took a stab at five to ten percent. Um, the staff time would be to process the appeals, and right now we manage about two thousand complaints in a given year. Mm -hmm. um, we work, we develop a case record. This would pr require additional documentation, and then the actual administration of the process to bring those appeals forward, which will take commission time. Um, it's, this is an estimate. This isn't a commission bill. This is what we, we thought reasonably we would need to actually um, implement the law if you guys pass it. Representative O'Neill. Thank you, Madam Chair. Right, so there's uh, 2,000 complaints processed a year, and uh, it's a lot. <laughs> That's a lot of complaints. So I, I just, I'm concerned that maybe we would see that increase substantially. Uh, is there any concern with the PUC that that would substantially increase from the 2,000 that you had uh, in the prior year? Mr. Seifert. Madam Chair, um, Representative, I, I don't know if I'd say it's concern, but certainly something we're aware of and would monitor. And um, this, is, this is not, we haven't done an analysis on other states mm -hmm. to see. I think every state has a, a distinct way of, of processing complaints. So um, this is our, you know, this is a conservative estimate on what it would t take to do this. Yeah. Thank you, Madam Chair. Representative um, Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. I think, though, it's worth noting every state has a distinct way, but every state has a way 
except for Minnesota. We are a clear outlier here in that we do not give our consumers an opportunity to get a final uh, agency action that they can, if they choose, take uh, to a court. So we are an outlier in that respect. Okay. Just a, just really quick. Oh, sure, you bet. Representative Thank you, uh, Just really quickly, I, I don't disagree with that. I'm just trying to reconcile two full-time people if we just had a handful of complaints. And so if, if you have a handful of complaints, but you've got two full-time people handling a handful of complaints, I was just trying to reconcile the two. So mm -hmm. I appreciate that. Thank you. Next on the list is Representative Carroll. Thank you, uh, Chair. And this uh, question is for the author. Under Subdivision 4, Judicial Review, I'm familiar with uh, most cases where when you uh, exhaust your <coughs> internal appeals, you then go to the Court of Appeals if you're going to go for Judicial Review. In this case, you have it going to District Court. I wonder if you can explain the thinking, the reasoning, the rationale for that. Representative Stevenson. I'll defer to Mr. Elwood because he just whispered in my ear that he has that one. So. Mr. Elwood. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair and Representative Carroll, um, you're correct that the uh, PUC's decision is tantamount to a district court decision and therefore the appeal typically goes to the Court of Appeals. But all of the complaints in that category are big ticket kinds of things. Rate case complaints, transmission line complaints, environmental reviews. These are individual consumer complaints and it was thought to uh, the folks who were my colleagues at Legal Aid and, and elsewhere that it made more sense to send a complaint of this nature uh, through the regular process to the district court first and then obviously if that was uh, an adverse decision it could be appealed then to the Court of Appeals but the nature of these complaints seemed to be more uh, suited initially for going from the commission to the district court. Okay, I appreciate that. Uh, I'm just. Any follow up, Mr. Yes, Carol? thank you. Thank you, Chair. Um, so, in uh, other uh, complaints where they're, where they're appealed, they go to the uh, Court of Appeals, for example, in the health context, if there's a health dispute, it won't go to a district court, it'll go to a uh, Court of Appeals. I'm just not used to seeing district court have jurisdiction over this, and I just was wondering the reasoning. I don't dispute that, I just wanted to understand it. Thank you. Representative, or Representative Elwood, sorry, Mr. Elwood. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, Representative Carroll, um, actually, we, uh, there have been many, many cases over, not many, many, but there have been many cases over time where there have been disputes um, in other contexts around utility service, uh, municipal utilities about uh, passing on bills, for example, from one customer to the next and liability, that have begun at the district court level and that have worked its way up through to the Court of Appeals or the Supreme Court. So it's not unprecedented, um, but I think you're right. I mean, you know, in, in this arena, typically a commission decision is appealed to the Court of Appeals, but as I said, it just seemed to make more sense with the nature of these complaints to start at the district court level, and there won't be many judicial appeals. And, and I, I, one more thing, uh, Representative Neal, just to follow up on some of the things that you were talking about, I mean, certainly no disputing the, the commission's analysis and, you know, obviously. But I just want to point out that in order to even get to first base here, you have to raise an issue, uh, a rule, a, a, a uh, complain about a dispute about a law, a legal dispute, complain about a rule or a tariff. So there is almost, you know, there's sort of an inherent um, screen before you can even get to the commission. And also, the, the bill also provides uh, for giving the commission the exact same authority they have today with any other complaint, whether it's brought by the Department of Commerce or another utility against another utility, in the sense that the commission could dismiss the case without, for having no merit, right away, off the bat, or they can decide to uh, institute an informal proceeding or a contested case. I, I, I appreciate the, the analysis there would be one case going to contested case. I'm not sure that, that may even be an overestimate because I can't even see some of these, this kind of a case ever get into a contested case. But of course it's not impossible and we give that the option. But it's the same option the commission has today for every other complaint. And it looks like a brief follow-up from just Representative to, Carroll. Thank you, Chair. I just wanted to make the uh, observation that I'm sure the Court of Appeals would appreciate this provision. 
<laughs> and district court may not. But like you say, there won't be very many, right? So it'll be a diluted effect. Next Thanks. on the list is Representative Swazinski. Thank you, Madam Chair. And just kind of a general question too. Um, so if I understand this correct, so we, we're essentially in, in these court cases, so if you would go to, if you had a dispute, you're currently not allowed, but you're all, you do have a, an option to go into the, to district court, correct? Mr. Elwood. If you have a dispute with your utility. Mr. Elwood. Uh, Madam Chair and Representative Swazinski, actually not. Because the only, the, the, as I said, the strange confluence of rules and law prohibit that. In order to get to the district court, you have to have a final determination from the Public Utilities Commission. If you can't get before the Public Utilities Commission in the first place, you can never get a final determination, and therefore you cannot go to court. We've had this situation before where we have actually tried that and been, and been shot down because we don't have a final determination from the adjudicative body of the, administ the administrative body. And so the answer is no, you can't do that. Representative Swazinski. And then my second question kind of goes to as far as the connection, you know, so consumers will be, you know, so if you're in, under the current situation, if I'm looking for what's the, what's the average estimate in other states of the length of the appeal process that you've seen? So if we're forcing uh, utilities to provide electricity to folks that aren't paying their bill, what's the average length of the, this process? What have, you, what have you seen in other states? Mr. Elwood. Uh, Madam Chair and uh, Representative Swazinski, I, I, I didn't do an analysis of that, but I can tell you before I came here in my pri previous life, I spent 15 years with the New York State Public Utilities Commission, and I was doing just this very thing. And I can tell you, um, and, and the volume of complaints there was significantly greater than here. And the time from informal complaint to formal complaint at the commission and the adjudication was pretty quick. I mean, we're talking weeks. Representative Swinski? So, I mean, the reason I'm asking that question, because, you know, obviously in the last three years we've extended that period of time that you know, through wintertime that you can't shut off people's utilities or sh shut off whatever that might be for non-payment. And, you know, and we've heard from utilities that that's been used as a tool um, that people understand that that's what they can do um, and they get away with it uh, by simply using that as a cash, man cash management tool on the backs of other ratepayers. Um, that this would potentially elongate that process that, you know, even if you're outside of those parameters, so let's say you're into, what is it? You go until April or May or whatever. Let's say you've not paid all winter, and then you decide to get to April. Now I want to use that as another tool then to just simply start an appeals process that you won't, so you can get by without uh, until your uh, until your lease is up, and then you move out, and then just never pay. Because once you, are are utilities allowed to follow uh, non-payment payees um, from address to address to recoup those costs? Mr. Elwood. A uh, couple of things. Uh, answer your last question first. Um, yes, they do. They can deny service at, at a uh, new address for failure to pay at an old address. Uh, that's number one. Second of all, um, there's a big misconception about in Minnesota about the cold weather rule that you can't shut off people during the during the winter. That is not true. You can. Uh, the cold weather rule requires payment from customers low-income customers, and first of all, the cold weather rule only applies to low-income customers and requires at um, maximum a, um, at, at maximum 10% of your income. So you, you could, uh, you have to pay something. So uh, utilities can shut off, they typically don't because they're good people and they don't want people to die. But on the other hand, they can't. So, um, and then the second thing, the last thing I want to point out is that on uh, lines 323 to 331, it does provide a number of requirements for the pendency, uh, for the, rest, the continuation or restoration of service during the pendency of the, of the appeal. So you have to do something. You have to pay something. You have to agree. There's all sorts of things in here that would go to the, your very question of just sort of trying to evade payment and try to stretch it out. And I can tell you, for, um, nobody, you know, I can only talk for legal aid, obviously. I can tell you, 
with absolute certainty, no one at Legal Aid would represent a client who is seeking simply to avoid payment. It would be simply because there's a question of law that we're raising, a question of a violation of a tariff or a rule or an unreasonable act in practice, which is the parameters of the current complaint system for everybody else. So um, I'll just stop at that. Representative Swisinski. Thank you, thank you, Madam Chair. Just this would be more. I don't know if there's anyone from the utilities here, but uh, you know, from a cost of representation, you know, the time before. So obviously, you'd be a lawyer, lawyer fees, lawyer costs. Um, that you know, I'm not sure how that relationship works with you and your potential client. But you know, what is you know, if you've got a lawyer from Excel or a lawyer from any other um, uh, investor-owned utility, you know, what is the increased cost to rate payers that potentially get passed on? Uh, just from a staff period of time, because if we're looking at what two two staff people to represent at the PUC, then what is the cost of to you know regulated it, regulated generators to to essentially represent their side or represent their position? Mr. Elwood, uh, Madam Chair, and, and uh, Representative Swazinski, I, I would argue that the cost is zero because for several reasons. Um, first of all. They're doing that now with complaints on every other type of complaint, and these are salaried employees, so that's what they do. So these are attorneys, there aren't fees. In terms of legal aid, legal aid does not charge fees. That's, what, that's our mission in life, like the public defenders, you know, for people who can't afford lawyers. But if, if, if it wasn't a legal aid client and another rate payer came to with a complaint, that rate payer would be paying their own lawyer, and that would have no impact, zero impact, on rates or anybody else would not, wouldn't have to pay for that. Seeing no further, Representative O'Neill. Sorry, just a really quick follow-up. I've been going through this fiscal note, which I, unfortunately, I just am looking at it now. Um, and, and I appreciate what Representative Carroll had just said about going to district court, but I don't see any uh, part of the fiscal note that references what the district court cost might be. And having served on the Judicial Committee quite some time, not currently, but in the past, um, I do see it in their reference as to what the bill does. I mean, it's, it's there on page 5, and it mentions Section 2, Subdivision 4, that it does go for judicial review, but I don't see anything from the court saying if they would incur any additional cost or need. And to be clear, it's going to the Judiciary um, Committee next, but if there's a brief response, we can certainly... It, it is going, Madam Chair, Representative, it is going to the Judiciary Committee next, but I think if you think about the, just the, if you continue to refine that down to, you know, one case potentially going to the district court, I'm not sure that that's something that they're going to note, but we'll see. And we'll go to the, we're going to the Judiciary Committee, and if they have an issue, you know. Did you have a follow up, Representative? Really quick. Okay. Yeah, I realize that we're not the Judiciary Committee, but normally the fiscal note is fairly complete, and I do, they, they did <laughs> reference it. So I just, you're a very thorough person, Representative Stevenson, if you would just maybe check in with the Supreme sure. Court and just say, you know, can you just take a look and just just avail us of any concerns? Representative Stevenson. Yeah, Madam Chair, Representative Neal, happy to follow up on that. I think usually the, the fiscal note process would have reached out to them, but maybe they missed it. We'll follow up. I don't see it. I don't see the review. I'm sorry. You're all good. Apologies. You're good. <laughs> and any closing statements about your bill, Representative Stevenson? Madam Chair, I think this is uh, a place, I think Minnesota is exceptional, but I don't think we want to be exceptional for this reason, so I'd ask for a yes vote. Mm -hmm. So Representative Stevenson renews his motion that House File 393, as amended, be re-referred to the Committee on Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law. All those in, flav in, in flavor, <laughs> nice. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. No. The motion prevails and the bill is re-referred. Thank you, <clears throat> Representative Stevenson.